Hello, Culture Matters Podcast. This is exciting today. Uh, before I introduce you to our guest, here's a quote I picked just for this episode. Uh, well, it's not uh, but <laughs> necessity, the mother of invention, Plato. My dear friend, Brian Hess is back again, founder of the Payment Group, top contracting school, friend to the Culture Matters podcast, mentor to many. Um, follow our journey, join our mission. What, what is that? I was flying back from the West Coast and I was reading the book, Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. <clears throat> and it was early, it was 2018. And uh, was trying to trying to come up with something that really defined how I felt about what we were trying to build at the pavement group. Like not, not, not the company, not the, you know, the revenue, but like, the feeling, you know, what was it going to be like, like the community, the, the connections, the, the culture. And I was reading that book, man. And I, was, I just started writing things down and I was like, man, how can we get people to connect to what we're doing? You know, how can we make people understand how important it is to have community around a company? How can we make people understand um that our mission is bigger than just paving parking lots or or more than just making money and uh that's what hit me man i was i was like literally doodling in the book uh that i was reading and i wrote down those words and uh they stuck man and to this day i really believe you know follow our journey you know the, the meaning meaning behind that is like follow our journey man like you know follow us on social media give us a like give us a comment tell your friends um and and join our mission is anybody who believes in what we're doing anybody who uh you know gives that like or comment or tells their friend about us they're part of our mission man they're part of our family they're part of our community that has helped build this organization into what it is in just over five years. And, you know, those, those words uh, are, are really meaningful there. If you walk into our office in Wexford, they're lit up in neon right inside the front door for a reason. Um, we believe in that, you know, and, and that has become a real rallying cry uh, for the people, you know, and, and I think that it makes the families of the people that work for us, uh, the families uh, you know, the, the extended families that are out around the company, it really makes them feel part of it when our people explain, you know, kind of what that means and why it means what it, what it does. And, uh, man, I'm glad that, you know, God gave me those words on that airplane. Cause I think, you know, it's been a huge piece of building what we've built. You know, there's, there's been times that have been really hard and, having that community of people believing in you and cheering you on is sometimes the difference between um, some really rough moments and moments that aren't as rough as they could be. Hmm. What have people said? What's been the feedback of that? I, I think they, you know, the, I, the, the most frequent is that people just enjoy watching. They enjoy following our journey. You know, they love watching us build. Uh, they love the transparency of how we share things. Um, and they like feeling part of the mission. You know, we've got uh, plenty, I've met plenty of grandparents of our team members and uh, they all comment about, and it's interesting, you know, 70 something, 80 something year olds um, talking about how they follow uh, along online and watch what we're doing. And they're so proud of their grandson or granddaughter for being part of an organization that's not just trying to be successful and, and, in business, but also making people more successful in their personal lives. And most importantly, uh, giving back in the process. Hmm. You know, this, this mission, what is the mission? The mission of the payment group is to improve people's lives in every aspect uh, that we possibly can. So it's, it's giving a better experience for our employees than they've ever had uh, being a part of any other team. It's simplifying the complicated problems that our customers have, uh, trying to manage the things that that they have to manage in, in managing hundreds or thousands of parking lots 
or roads. Um, and it's simplifying the complicated nature that our subcontractors, one team partners go through trying to run their businesses. So it's adding value and improving the lives of every single person that they touch. And, um, you know, we talk about this every week, but it's like when people experience the pavement group, they feel different. You know, they know that there's something unique about it. And uh, we we hear that from our customers a lot. You know, the the competitors or or people that are trying to prospect the customers that we do business with, our customers refer them to us. You know, they say you should do business with these people. And a lot of times they say like, oh, we we won't, we don't, we don't want to do business with um, national contractors or general contractors. And um, I've had several customers send me screenshots of conversations that they've had with these contractors saying, you know, give these guys a shot. They're different. You know, we we've experienced some of the things that you have too, but these guys are different. And and that's really our mission, right? Is to be, to be different, to be an example, to show people what it looks like um, when you stay true to your principles and values and uh, you do the things that really genuinely improve people's lives on a daily basis. What comes to mind that quote earlier in the show, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. What comes to mind? Um, our technology comes to mind. You know, when when we started this company, you know, I uh, I always knew, you know, I, I was doing what we refer to as pavement assessments. You know, uh, we were assessing properties and giving customers data that they hadn't received before. You know, I was doing that when I worked for other people. I had spreadsheets. I had, you know, old school maps, things like that. And when we started this company, I knew that would be the difference, right? It would be the way that we could really improve people's lives by helping them manage complicated portfolios uh, that allowed them not just to have a better life, but we would have a better life in the process because we would get more revenue from uh, every customer. You know, we'd have uh, a really healthy uh, revenue per per client uh, number, and that helps build a company uh, really well. And so I started, you know, selling this vision of, you know, man, what if, you know, what if we could give you all the data that you needed um, to be able to do the things that, you know, are really complicated for you in a much simpler process. And they were all ears, man. Every customer was like, yeah, how do I get that? You know, how do I, how do I do that? How do I get the information? And, uh, you know, we were doing it on Excel spreadsheets and Google Maps and, you know, all the old school things that were free because back then we didn't have we didn't have two nickels to rub together to invest in the technology. Right. And uh, it got to a point where we had so many that we had sold. Uh, we couldn't keep up in the manual nature of how to do that. And so um, my partner, Mike Kukim, you know, went after went after it, just went home and taught himself how to program and uh, built the very first tool that, you know, we were able to use with our clients to simplify that process. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's the innovation comes from necessity, right? It comes from, we know what the client needs. Uh, we've done such a good job of explaining it. And they've, they've been so open to the idea that the combination of those things requires innovation. You know, it's not a suggestion, it's a requirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that a lot of things in business happen that way. You know, you, you get pressure, you try to figure out how am I going to do all this? You know, I'm, I'm working 16 hours a day. I probably can't do much more than that. Right. So I've got to find some outlet to be able to improve my own life, you know, and the lives of those people around me. And so, yeah, that, that is the first thing that comes to mind, man. It's, we, we talk about that all the time. Like, thank goodness that we were selling out over our own capacity in the beginning uh, because, you know, it, it led us to this point of, you know, having one of the most innovative solutions in our industry uh, to be able to offer clients. What do you think the lesson is there in the selling? You know, you sell, you're selling, I wrote this, that we're selling over capacity. Yeah, I, I think, you know, anybody who's building a business, you're, you're going to have moments where, you know, you're, you're definitely testing your limits of what you're capable of doing. And, you know, if, if you're not, 
um, you're probably going a little bit too slow. Like, and I, I say this to our team still to this day, you know, there's a balance between being aggressive and being reckless, you know, it, reckless is a bad idea. Uh, you know, not understanding because essentially the, the difference between those two aggressive, you can handle, you can find a way to work through reckless is going to leave clients disappointed because you don't have any ability to be able to deliver uh, at that level. Um, and so for us, it was, you know, really trying to get some of our lives back, some of our time back, uh, the innovation, you know, it, it wasn't to that point of irresponsible. Uh, we, it would, it, it, if we wouldn't have taken our foot off the gas until we established this solution in place, it would have gotten there quickly. Right. Because there, there was a need and so every, everybody said yes. And so, you know, when you have everybody saying yes, it's very easy to see that, you know, you can you can get into a real problem uh, in a short period of time. But um, my, my advice is always be aggressive uh, and, and keep your eye on where that line of being reckless is. What what, what do you think the discomfort is with, with entrepreneurs when they think about 10 years out, 15 years out, 20 years out. I think from, from the entrepreneurs that I see, um, you know, there's a couple issues I think that lead them to be less likely to look in the future. Number one is that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs don't really build a strong foundation, in their business. So it's, it's, it's harder to see how it would scale. It's harder to comprehend, you know, how we would get there. So it it leaves them in a place of only looking, you know, next year or this year or maybe next month, or maybe they're trying to figure out how to make payroll next week, you know, and there's there's a large portion of entrepreneurs that, that function like that. And so there's a, a lack of business acumen in one area of business, you know, maybe they're great at um, actually performing the work in our world, but on the office side of things, they're, they're not great. Um, on the marketing side, the sales side, there's a bunch of different buckets. And if they're not, you know, they're, they're not working on those buckets or finding people that can be in those buckets that are really good. If they're not, then it leads them to have short-term vision, right? There's a, there's an, a reaction to the lack of knowledge or lack of business acumen in those certain areas. Um, the other part is, is I don't think that people uh, are really taught to, to dream big. You know, I think that a lot of people as kids, even as entrepreneurs, if you don't get around the right people that are encouraging you uh, to dream bigger, to push harder, to expand your vision, to take some calculated risks. Um, I know a lot of entrepreneurs that just function in a conservative only approach, right? Uh, that they're they're happy doing, you know, three to 5% more next year, 10% more next year. And that's, that's good enough because, you know, they're, they're afraid somebody in their family took a risk and it didn't work. And so now they're, you know, they're, they're kind of in that spot, but I think there's a lot of dynamics that don't allow people uh, to look out, but I'd say the one that I see the most is that people lack the foundation in their business to be confident enough in the stability that it could go into the future at a certain level. And, and you know, I guess there's some research attached to that too. Like what is the actual mar market availability? You know, what, what could you do? You know, I ask that question to some of the guys uh, and girls in top contractor school all the time. Like what, it, what, it, you know, what's it look like in your market? Like how many other contractors are there and how much revenue are they doing? And you, you go and you add it all up and, and then you ask them any more. Oh yeah, this one. Oh yeah, this one. And so they end up like the the market, the immediate market cap that they have access to is like three times the size of what they think it is. And so, you know, it, it's a combination of all those things. Like you actually have to figure out like what kind of business are you going to be? And then how are you going to build a foundation today that allows you to put all of that revenue, to put all of those resources, to put all of that stuff on your shoulders and it not crumble under the pressure of what's ahead. Because, you know, that's that's the deal, man. Every time you increase by, you know, $10 million, $20 million, it's a, it's a significant, it's like 
creating a whole new business all over again in a 365 day period. And you do that over and over and over again, you reinvent yourself. And so I think that, you know, for a lot of entrepreneurs out there, I think it's a, you know, that's a good test for the people who are listening is like, have you done that exercise? Have you looked at what's possible and how would I get there? Um, you know, I, I tell people regularly to build out their future organizational chart. You know, what does it look like if you're a $10 million business? Okay. What does it look like at 50? What does it look like at 250? Because, you know, it's good to see that vision. It's good to see how many people is it going to take to do this? And what ends up happening is their current business is more successful because they actually figure out, you know, how much work volume can this one person in this position actually handle? You have to know that to be able to scale a company, right? And so mm. uh, all of that is is relevant to why I think people don't look into the future enough because, you know, they haven't taken the time to gain the knowledge um, or maybe they just don't believe in the foundation that they've built to be able to get to that level. And it's it's a couple turns of the dial to be able to get it there. 2030. Who's following our mission or following our journey, joining our mission at that point? Well, it's, you know, it, it's a, it's an interesting thought every time that you, you start to, you know, challenge yourself to think about that. You know, when I look at, you know, our projections of where we, we plan to be, it's like, you know, I think about what's happened in five years. You know, I remember sitting in a meeting with you and you saying, uh, I think the comment was like, Wow. You know, that goal is five point, we're only 5.6% of the way to where we are. And I looked at you and I said, yeah, dude, we're f right now, four years ago or three years ago, we were 5.6% of where we are right now at this moment. Like that's how much we've multiplied. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. And so, you know, it, it's wow. Eli and I were talking about this on our flight last night on the way out to Arizona here. It's so interesting, man, how you can only see, you can only see as far as the capacity that you have in the moment. And so, you know, when, when you're doing $3 million a year, it would be pompous. It would be uh, irresponsible to be able to say, we're going to be a $5 billion company, right? Like, when you have nothing to back that up, right? No knowledge, no exposure, you haven't done the research yet. But when you get to a point where you start to see the real capacity of, of the market that you're in, the real need, um, the different verticals, and you take the time to build out a vision and, and a forecast of like, what is actually out there in this vertical? Like how much money is being spent and how could we participate in that what per what percentage will we want to participate in who's a good customer for us how could we add value to these to these clients and people and uh when you start breaking that down systematically it just makes a lot more sense as to how you would get there and so it doesn't seem unbelievable it doesn't seem you know arrogant or pompous it seems like well, that's probably just what's going to happen if if we do what we say we're going to do and we continue to build the foundation and we continue to lean in to the discomfort of um, new things, you know, and, and new ventures. And we're willing to, uh, as we always say, not eat the marshmallow, right? We're willing mm -hmm. to keep investing, mm -hmm. right? Keep investing back into the business. The multiplication of what happens on the back end of that it becomes undeniable. It's like, you know, you start to get the right people in the door. You get more salespeople. You start to look at the equation and say, okay, this is how we get there. This is how many salespeople it's going to take. Eli just said to me yesterday, you know, I used to think that it would take, you know, X number of salespeople because I was thinking, you know, our sales folks would sell, you know, a couple million dollars a year was his vision of what was good, you know, two or $3 million. And now he's saying like, dude, I don't actually know what the cap is, but I can see 10 to 15 per salesperson in our organization. Mm -hmm. Well, think about that. Do the math, right? Let's just say that it's six times, you know, now his vision is six mm -hmm. times bigger, seven times bigger than what it was. Well, that's an easy path to say, okay, 
well, if if we're you know saying 50 million today, then 350 million isn't out of the question because we've just cracked one of the codes of how we're going to multiply revenue without having to multiply headcount out, right? Like we're going to build around these strategic salespeople to be able to create that revenue flow. And so those are those are the things that really excite me, man. It's like when you when you figure out a new combination of a lock in business mm. and you watch the people around you start saying like, now I can see, I can see the path to a billion dollars in revenue. I can see the path to where it's at. I can see how all of these, um, all of these other complementary things that we've got going on that are attached to our business, how they're feeding the revenue, how they're feeding, they, they, they start to unlock those things. Now it makes sense because now we're shaking hands with different people. We're walking into different rooms. And so now just imagine, man, like when I started this business, I thought that a big customer was a couple of million dollars a year. Now my vision of that is completely different. And so now I'm finding myself making decisions mm. that get me into the rooms that put me in front of the customer's that are not seven figure customers, eight figure customers. I've yet to find the place that's a nine figure customer uh, that I feel comfortable saying that, but I know I know where it's at. I just haven't made it to the conversation to validate that. You, now you know where that's at. I, I know where it's at, but I haven't successfully gotten into the room to have the meaningful conversation to say that's a real hundred million dollar revenue opportunity. But I know where it's at. Right. I've had enough surface level conversations. Now I got to keep I got to keep swinging the axe. Right. How important is it to know where it's at? Well, if you don't know where it's at, you certainly can't find it. Right. And, and you know, I think that uh, one of the key things that the responsibility of the CEO is to do is to find those opportunities, is to take the time that we have to think, our responsibility is to think on behalf of the organization, to take that time to discover those things, to take the time to dig into those things, to, to take the influence that hopefully everybody that's in that position has, has established. If they haven't, they need to establish it so that when they walk into those rooms, somebody's willing to have that conversation with them and that their integrity is high enough that people would be comfortable referring them, right? And so, you know, when you start to ask the right questions and you listen to conversations and you add value to other people, which is what, what has happened to me is I've added value to so many people over the years that people try to find a way to pay that forward to me. And so those introductions that have happened over the years, they were just natural introductions where, you know, I get I got into a conversation uh, last year that led to what I'm saying now, uh, uh, you know, a hundred million dollar revenue opportunity. That's that's just from conversation and knowing what somebody did in their career and them asking me, well, what do you guys do? And I explained to them and they said, you know, when the time is right, when all of these things align, give me a call and I'm going to introduce you to the right people. And so, you know, to this point, I've just been patient building what it is that was the vision of, you know, how, because we couldn't, that last year at that time, we couldn't handle a hundred million dollar opportunity well. So now what we're building and what we're rolling out right now in real time, once we master that and we test it and make sure that everything works, like by the end of 2023, mm -hmm. we'll be able to walk into that room have a meaningful conversation and look those people in the eye and know for sure that we can handle a hundred, 200, 250 million dollars worth of work effectively. Now it doesn't mean we can handle that like tomorrow, right? In an instant. Yeah. We know for sure that we can build uh, around the technology that we have to be able to handle um, pumping something through that, like that through our system. What do you think an entrepreneur is saying this needs to be taking away from that piece of the conversation. Well, I think, I think the one thing is uh, going back to what I said earlier, be aggressive, but don't be reckless. It's like, you know, don't, don't tell the $250 million opportunity that you can handle it. If you can't, the more honest you are, the more respect you're going to get. 
and you tell them, here's the timeline of what we're working on to be able to handle that. Because, you know, those people have a respect for the process. They understand what it takes to build business. They understand what it takes to be able to support something like that. And, and frankly, they're going to see through your bullshit if you, if you don't tell the truth. And so you see that a lot, you know, where people say, yeah, I can do that. And they have no, absolutely no idea how they're going to do it. And and to some degree, there's there's nuance to everything in entrepreneurship. Sometimes you have to to figure it out as you go, but not two hundred and fifty million, not a hundred million dollars worth of opportunity, right? Uh, you got to know where that balance is to be able to make the decisions that put you in the best position for longevity, right? Because getting that client you know, getting 20, 30, $50 million worth of business and then screwing it up and never having another opportunity. Uh, what, a, what a disaster, right? What a, what a shame and what, how difficult, there's probably only a few of those opportunities that exist in the market. And so you can't screw it up. You got to be patient. You got to have the vision and you got to be able to sell the vision to them of exactly what it's going to look like. And then you got to work your ass off and be able to create reality out of that vision that you sold. How do you get people to buy in internally? Leadership, I think is one, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, the vision of the leader, the certainty of the, of the leader, the honesty of the leader. You know, if, if you are, a leader that has a strong vision, but isn't somebody that always follows through on their word, that's going to crack your culture. You know, it, it's, it's a variety of things. And, you know, when you have a crystal clear vision, like I can see, you asked the question earlier, 2030, what does it look like? Like, I can see that, man. Um, you know, yesterday, the first, for the first time, uh, our logo was on the scoreboard inside of the Pittsburgh Steelers football stadium. And uh, one of my friends texted me and said, I remember sitting in these seats with you when you said this would happen. Cause I could, I knew it, man. I could feel that vision. Right. And I knew what, I knew what it took to get there. I didn't know the exact investment that it would take. I didn't know, but like when you believe in something and you have a level of certainty like your actions will manifest it into reality. It's like, you know, manifestation doesn't happen just because you visualize something. You have to visualize it and then you got to go work your ass off to make it happen. And so, you know, to add to the answer to the question, like how, how do you sell a vision? Well, you better be putting in the work as the leader. You know, you, you better be the first person in the office and the last person to leave most of the time or all the time. Um, you know, because people follow those people who are investing into the mission themselves. You know, uh, one of the, one of the lessons that I was just teaching somebody last week about, you know, finances and investment. I said, you know, just imagine the difference if you're an entrepreneur and you go and you pitch somebody your business idea. And I say, Jay, I've got this great idea. And what I need from you to get this moving is I need $4 million. And I can get this idea moving. And you say to me, okay, great. How much have you invested? Well, I don't have anything. I'm just going to put in the work. Okay. Now, option B, scenario B is I come to you and I say, Jay, I've got this idea. This is what it is. I'm going to work my ass off to, to make it happen. And I've got $2 million of my own money. I'm going to put every penny of it on the line. Would you be willing to put 2 million in too? Well, I can tell you which one is more likely because if I'm going to lose everything, somebody knows that somebody's going to go all in, right? And it's the same thing with effort. It's like, are you all in? Are you, are you demonstrating what it takes to create that vision? Because if all you are is a visionary that doesn't work, people won't follow you, man. It, it'll be, there'll be an indicator of that in turnover. There'll be an indicator of that in culture. There'll be an, in, you know, there'll be plenty of things that will show you if that is not the case. And so uh, it's a combination of things. But to me, everything rises and falls on leadership and uh, leadership 
part of leadership, a major part of leadership is vision. And it doesn't matter if you're the CEO or you're a leader within the organization, you better have a crystal clear vision of where you're going or people will be hesitant to follow you wherever that is. How can someone that's listening, they consider themselves the visionary, how do they know if they're not, they think they're putting the work, but they're not. I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's a gut instinct, man. Like, do you, know, do you feel, you know, one of the things that I've done for years, my planner on the bottom left page of my planner every day, there's a W and there's an L. Did I win today or did I lose today? And oh. winning, I can check that box if I feel good about what I accomplished today. If I left it all on the field, if I did the things necessary to move our mission forward, to help our employees. You know, my, my goal is to make as many wealthy people within our company as I possibly can uh, in the process of executing all of this. Well, if I'm not if I'm not moving that mission forward in a day, then I lost. Right. And so for me, you know, over a period of, uh, of a year. There's going to be a handful of days that I lose. There's probably going to be, you know, 20 days over a year long period that I don't check the box. And if you don't keep track of how many days you're losing, how many days that you're not yourself, how many days you're off track because of whatever circumstance presents itself that day in business and happens to all of us. If you're not tracking that and you're not giving yourself, you know, when something happens, you give yourself a day or two to figure out, you know, how to work through that. And hopefully over time that goes down to you give yourself a couple hours to work through that. But that's it, man. And you got to get back on the horse because those people around you are depending on you, right? And so um, I think it's a self, I don't think there's any test that you can do that is more valuable or more accurate than testing yourself. And, and that is how successful was I today? How effective was I today? Did I make a difference today? Did I move somebody's life in the, po- in, in the right direction today? Um, did I have a meaningful conversation today? Or that I just have an average at best day. And if I had an average at best day, I better make sure that tomorrow is packed, that, that before I leave for that day, my planner is filled out, the plan for tomorrow is set, that when I walk in, I've already got momentum because of how I finished this shitty day that I just had. And so I think, I think it's self-evaluation, man. It's like finding ways to hold yourself accountable. Nobody can do that for you.